Um, hi, everyone. My name is Eugene Hernandez. I'm the director of the New York Film Festival. And nice to see you all. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to our New Wave members populating this bar tonight. Um, you make our work possible throughout the year. As you know, nonprofits like ours rely on your support to do our work. So thank you for the support that you provide to our organization year round. And on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, I wanna say thank you to our new partners, our new friends at Nordstrom for hosting this event tonight. Let's hear it for Nordstrom. I haven't actually been in this building. I was saying uh, earlier, I've been to the men's shop across the street and when they first opened, I'm, I'm from California and I'm familiar with Nordstrom and um, when they opened across the street, I spent some time in there. And I remember saying to my colleague Liz a couple years ago now, hey, there's a Nordstrom in the neighborhood. We got to talk to them. So I'm glad that that conversation led to all of us being able to get together here tonight. So thank you again to Nordstrom and um, this fantastic evening of cocktails and conversation about an absolutely terrific film playing at the festival. You're going to learn more about it shortly. Velvet Underground, which played at the festival a couple of times, and it's going to be opening at our theaters at Lincoln Center. So tell a friend and spread the word and come back and see it three or four times with your friends and family in a couple weeks. Um, again, thank you to Nordstrom for not only hosting this panel uh, about the making of Velvet Underground, but for their generous gift cards, which have been shared with everyone tonight. Thank you, we appreciate that. Um, my note here says the store closes tonight at eight, so there's gonna be some time to do some shopping after this conversation. So feel free to shop at the men's and women's stores immediately after the panel or come back another time to shop. Um, so in order to kick things off, I wanna to introduce tonight's moderator. Um, Soleil, Nath Soleil Nathwani is a new wave, a member of the new wave leadership and a cinephile who's been a true, truly committed to all of our programming all the time. Thank you Soleil for always being around and always talking about movies and talking up movies to your friends and your, your circle. So thank you for that. Um, Soleil is a membership, uh, a member of our leadership committee, as I mentioned, and she's based here in New York. Um, and she writes regularly for Rolling Stone India and other publications. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over her, to her in a minute, but I wanna say just one more thing. Um, please keep us all safe throughout the, tonight's event. When you're not eating and drinking, just keep your mask up if you don't mind. And um, other than that, have a great time. Hope to see you in the next few days at the festival. And let me hand it over to Soleil. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Eugene. Can you all hear me? Um, I'm so happy to be joined by three of this wonderful film's producers, Carolyn Hepburn, Christopher Clements, Julie Goldman, and the two editors, uh, Adam Kernitz and Alfonso Gonzalez. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'd also just like to say before we uh, go into questions that it's so exciting to have this film at the festival and open on its theatrical run with us and at the Film Forum on October 13th because um, I think for one thing, there's been no definitive documentary about the band as there has been as there have been with many other iconic bands, but also because this film reflects um, New York in such a time of activity and creativity in the 60s and sees a band that really embraced the intersection of film, art, and music like no other band had at the time. And I really don't think uh, another band has since, um, but that's up for debate. Um, and it's really special to have that kind of blossoming after we've all been deprived of arts and the collective enjoyment of them for so long. Um, so I really, how many people have seen the film? Oh. Well, I would say about half. For, for the other half, I would, I would urge you to go see it. And this is a film that can be watched, I think, multiple times, and you'll see something new. Um, with that, I'm going to start with a question for all of the panel, if you can just address this briefly. I just wanted to know, on a personal level, what was your first introduction, entry point to the band? It may have been this film, but I, I imagine it's not. Uh, my entry point was in when I was in college, I 
was into some other uh, musicians uh, and kind of I had the realization that they all kind of were influenced by the Velvet Underground. So they came from the same place. They came from the same place. So I went back to them and um, I, I I liked punk rock, but when I heard heroin, I knew that it was going somewhere else, and that just captivated me from there. They were going to talk about other things, and I just followed. Um, when I was in high school at Music and Art, when I it mean, was Music and Art before it was um, back with LaGuardia, um, I remember... Um, we would sit outside sometimes, not Leslie, because she was a very good student, but we would sit outside sometimes oh. and um, listen to music. And I just remember people, there was somebody who was really into the Velvet Underground who was playing it a lot. And that's how we all kind of got to know them. Yeah, it is hypnotic that way, the, the music. I, I ha wasn't familiar with, with a lot of it. And this film just sucked me in. Um, similarly, I grew up here in New York. Uh, in the punk rock scene as well. And I must have been 15 or 16 when I was introduced sort of to the roots of where I, where I was. Yeah, it's the Velvet Underground. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I think it was film school, when I went to film school in England. That's how I first heard. That's a really important intersection of music and film that we'll get to in this conversation. But I'd like to start, start with a question, a really simple question for the producers of how you uh, came to this film and what you imagined the roadblocks might be at the outset to getting it made and then what they ended up being. I mean, we came to it because um, David Blackman, who's a producer also on the film, who was at, uh, who runs Polygram, uh, films for Universal Music had um, approached Todd and Christine Vachon about doing the film and they were keen to find partners who had experience in documentary because they strictly do have done fiction up until that point. Um, so we got this call and I just remember <laughs> I said to Carolyn, Todd Haynes, Velvet Underground, she literally screamed at the top of her lungs. So I'll let her take it and then Chris can... Chris screamed silently. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I also kind of fell to the ground at the same time as screaming. But um, uh, I was also, besides just the Velvet Underground, I've always been a huge fa a fan of Andy Warhol. I, I love all of his art and his filmmaking. And it was very clear at the very beginning that we needed the cooperation of the Warhol Museum right. in order to really be able to tell the story of this band because the majority of film that exists was film that was shot at Warhol's factory, either by Warhol himself or there were other, a lot of filmmakers who were hanging around in the factory like Danny Williams or Paul Morrissey. Um, so a lot of that footage is, is curated at the museum. And we wound up licensing, um, the film is two hours long. We license a total of two and a half hours because the film uh, has multiple uh, screens, split screens, and there's a lot of visual energy going on but about 40 minutes of that is just from the Warhol Museum alone. Mm -hmm. So we really realized- like We were soon. doing a lot of things like we, like we pulled Todd in to host a dinner for them. Like we were, <laughs> we were trying to come up with really clever ways to ingratiate ourselves to them. And um, that was a, it was a long process. It, it was a very long process, but we got to the producers and Todd, we got to go to the museum very early on just as an introductory and go into their archives and meet with their head curator. And he was telling us about the films that they had, but also the he was pointing us in other directions of other filmmakers we should go to and other artists we should think of. And like, we were all just like giddy, you know, like we're like, ooh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we had to see, you know. To put on the gloves. We had to put on gloves things. and touch, you know, certain artwork that was original. And um, so we got to, you know, spend some time in the museum. And it was really, you know, we were fearful because we knew how important that was gonna be. Right. But they turned out to be an incredible collaborator. And 
understood kind of how this also helps people understand Warhol himself and bring interest into him. So it ultimately worked out, but that was a long road. Chris, was there anything you wanted to add? Just, uh, just that uh, Todd's original idea was to repurpose experimental film. And his idea was that he's gonna use that as a new way of telling this story because it was the only like language that would really communicate what the Velvets were trying to do. And I loved that as a concept. And I, I'm a very big fan of Maya Deren and Paul Sharitz and all experimental filmmakers. So I was like, this is wonderful. He's gonna repurpose it. I didn't know if he was gonna be able to do it. And we worked with him diligently as Carolyn and, and, and Julie just said, and we got him the stuff. And with these two great editors in collaboration, we were actually able to come up with what I feel is a new form of storytelling utilizing this material. And that's the most exciting part for me. I mean, the, the obvious challenge of this film is the archive clearance and the music clearance. Right. That was the, the you know, I mean, it's, aside from shaping it into a beautiful film, which is the biggest challenge of all. But um, one thing that you said, like, we thought would be easy, I thought for sure we would be able to get Paul Morrissey and his films mm -hmm. because we I, we met him, we know him. His, his goddaughter is, a like, a consulting producer on the film. But he had a lot of... Um, issues and uh, you know physical and, and health and so we just never were able to get that so that was the one thing I was like that's easy that's and it didn't happen yeah that it's, was the white whale that we didn't get it's worth mentioning for people who haven't seen the film or may not be as familiar with the band that Andy Warhol um, took managed the band and took a lot of footage of them and that remains I think uh, some of the very little footage of them that that is around um, and the way that it has been incorporated in this film is really wonderful. I want to get to visual language with Adam and Alfonso, but I just I have one more follow up question for the three of you. And that is, um, Karen, uh, you, Carolyn, you said you were very you were really excited when 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 you thought this was going to be a collaboration with Todd Haynes. And I'm wondering, Todd has made um, I'm Not There. Um, which is a reflection on Dylan and Velvet Goldmine, which I think, which is a reflection on the glam, glam rock era and takes a lot of inspiration from the Velvets. And I'm wondering if, given that he had not made a documentary that was considered uh, historically accurate and that his films had been, had taken more license, did that give you pause at all? No, that's what's really interesting, actually. He's a very quick study. And, and he's also, as you know, he does intense research. Now, all we needed to do was help him back off. That's mm. all he needed. We knew that that's all he really needed because he wasn't in a conversation to, to make him understand, to give that empty space, to, to make a proposal to somebody that's being interviewed and give them the space to actually think through it and breathe through it, to not just jump in because he's such a conversationalist. He'd jump in. So we had like these small adjustments to make and we knew that he was gonna be able to actually uh, get the material that. that was necessary to build this. Yeah, I mean, he's an incredible artist. And we sat, we had, we sat down, we all went out and we had lunch and we talked to him about what his vision was for the film. And it was really like, how do we help you get to the place where you can achieve that? Um, and it was very clear that he had a, a very, distinct vision for this film and he's a beautiful filmmaker and he you know was what he wanted to do with it was clearly within his grasp easily. Carolyn? Yeah um he he absolutely knew he wanted it to be just about sorry I feel like I'm turning this way um just as much about the culture than it was about the band and um Todd just like every uh, Chris just said, like he, the amount of what he knows already just before he even started to do research, he knew so much about the band and the artists and everything. And he's just like, um, he's a, kind of obsessive <laughs> about it. He like, he wants to know every single kind of texture and detail. And I think that's why his films are so, wonderful because they have this like authenticity because right. he's really you know every single little detail 
is very thought out. Like for example, something as small as the backdrops that we use to film our interviewees on, we created, you know, Sykes that had like a, he's like, I want it to feel like New the York, texture. the texture. So it had this kind of, kind of, uh, you know, a uh, paint texture to it that we had to like get samples for. And we went through the process several times. And once he picked it, we, it was easy to kind of go forward, but we, you know, he, him and Ed and Fonz and, and Adam, like they, they thought about things kind of very deeply. And, you know, even like the colors that were picked, you know, Maureen, Mo Tucker was on yellow because it was like, that's the banana album and that's representative of the, the Velvet Underground and she should be the, the representative color. You know, like there's like thoughts to the process on a very Detailed, granular, granular level. level. Yeah. And those backdrops are in our office if anybody wants yeah, them. Yeah, if anybody wants them, you can come check them out. Two person um, to throw away. So to your point, Carolyn, about visual language, the, the film is really visually spectacular. And I read a review that said, um, and I would love Adam and Alfonso, your, your reaction to this, that um, Warhol said the velvet sound like, sounded like his movies looked. And now Haynes has made a movie that looks like the velvet sounded. I wonder if you could react to that, speak to that. And uh, because it's such a mind bending mix of uh, uh, photos, archival footage, as you mentioned, film footage, um, so could you speak to that, that statement? Um, yeah, I think that was the first mandate was to figure out the right tool for the job that is the Velvet Underground, right? Um, so some of the best comments I've heard, so in our film, you hear part of one Velvet Underground song for the whole first hour and then you don't hear any Velvet Underground music for the first hour. Oh, this is a surprise to you, right? Yes. Yeah, so I hear a lot. You know, oh, I didn't even realize that. I was getting I didn't really pulled that. in by the yeah. drone sound, which, yeah. uh, which is the sound you're talking about, so, right? Yeah, so it, we hear. It was like being in a sound bath yeah. slightly. I, I got very. So everyone I've spoken to has said, oh, I didn't even realize that. And I think it's because you feel like you're in the experience of the Velvet Underground so deeply that you don't even realize that their music is not playing. Um, so yeah, we worked really hard to put the audience in a trance, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Alfonso. Well, in the beginning, Todd actually had a visual idea. He's so visual. He was a, he studied painting too, uh, that he, he, he has, he had drawings when he talked to me and Adam, yeah. how are we going to do this? So the Chelsea girls, the, the Warhol film was always, okay, we're going to have, he knew we we're going to have two screens at the same time for as long as we could. But then he's, he's like, oh, then we can do three or we can do six, or we can do four that way. So he, everything was really drawn and given to us. Wow. And we had the, actually the freedom to add them, expand it, like let's do more than that, let's twice the number and we can split. And he says, I never wanna have, whenever I have full screen is very special. So I think there's probably five times in a film. Yeah, there's almost never a time where there's a full a screen. Full screen the maybe. interviews are, you know, to the left or to the right with a lot of black next to them. And you're always being kept on your toes as, as you're watching. And yes, when it does go full screen, it's with a lot of intent. Yeah, but he was very specific to be the, visually the, the sort of, how do you tell the story? We always was super conscious how much we're going to use, what kind of, what, how, we, how we split those screens and what's in every screen. So it's not only how to use the content or how to tell the story, but visually you have to be super uh, specific. And I think you build that momentum because the, the number of screens at some point starts exploding as you go along, which is also has a really uh, entrancing effect, I think. I, I also want to thank all of these guys because they never once told us to stop. Um, and they have to go out Though and license we, it we all. We wish yeah. they would. <laughs> But that, you know, for example, there's a three minute stretch where there's 12 screens going. So that's right. 36 minutes of archival in three minutes of time. And they never told us to stop. They it just had a great it. effect. Yeah, they it worked. did, it really did. So to that point, um, uh, Adam and Alfonso, I, I think at some point, one of the interviewees um, says, and, and remind me who, who this is, but says that, 
uh, the, the velvets were all about subtracting and not adding. And I'm wondering how you thought about that, because I think um, the, the best editors know how to subtract and you had so much to work with. Tell me how you thought about parsing through all of that. Yeah, you can go. Um, I think we left a lot out. I think that we left a lot of um, interview out and we asked the audience to make connections of their own. Um, by following the visuals. That was, that was clear that we wanted the music and the visuals to lead and everything else would come after that. Um, so the interviews are sort of in third place when it comes to how you receive mm -hmm. your information. So we, we left a lot out. And I think at the end, you get the whole story, you know? It is remarkably spare when you look at it yeah, at, when you in think just story of the terms, volume of archival because it's so much more so. about the sustain and the being in the moment. An experience is what. I mean, we wanted to, the experience to be to listen to the music and to understand the world, to to watch the world. Uh, so that was always like, okay, they can see this, and that's enough. You know, how to this? It's less about subtracting but distilling to just. Uh, like what, what's really needed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, like, we're trying always to do that. And we had also, I mean, we were so lucky because we got stems from the songs. So the songs are separated. So we have just a drum of the whole Venus in Furs, just a guitar, just Lou's voice. So we can split and play it and create a completely different sonic experience doing that. I mean, we actually did a few times. Yeah, we, Fonz and I wrote a new Velvet Underground song to open the film <laughs> with. A pleasure. I'm sure, it would, it, and I'm sure they would have enjoyed you deconstructing their, uh, their, their work that way. They seem to embrace that kind of um, artistry around what they were doing. Um, just as a follow-up from that, you know, I think, I would actually encourage you all to also listen to uh, Eugene interviewed Todd, and there's a there's a that, that there's a podcast of that, um, and I think probably it's on the it's on Film Society's uh, YouTube channel also. Um, but in that interview, I think Todd says to Eugene that this film this is a film about film in so many ways because Warhol was so intimately involved with the band. And at the time, you know, Jonas Mikas was at the, at the forefront of avant-garde cinema. So I'm wondering when you both, um, when you both thought about showcasing cinema in that way, uh, how did that put more pressure on you? How did that make you feel? And how did you, how did you think about filming this, uh, this, this other film that you had access to? I don't think we felt, I mean, it was, it's, it's kind of liberating, as a matter of fact. It wasn't a pressure. Yeah. We have this wealth of everything you can imagine from that time uh, that you can use however way we saw fit. And, uh, and we did it. And we experimented, like, let's not, let's use this footage not being obvious, but there's, there's, there's always a connection. If you really pay attention, there's always a connection. It may not be what you think it is or maybe not, like, Obvious, but there's always a connection to what you see and what you hear and what people are saying. Oh, sure. uh, so yeah. it's it's a challenge, but I think a, a great challenge. Uh, uh, I just thought it was a lot of fun to have that uh, mandate put on us. Um, I think we played a lot with it. I, I think um, one of my favorite sequences of the film is that, you know, the first 15 minutes when it's basically just the structure of Chelsea Girls, it's two screens going, and you have just a screen test on one side of either Lou Reed or John Cale, and then on the other side, you have the archival that matches the story that they're telling about their youth. Um, sometimes the archival was directly, you know, John would talk about the coal mines and you would see coal miners, but sometimes he would talk and the image wasn't, it was metaphoric, or yeah. atmospheric. And I think what happens in those moments is, you know, it forces you to wonder what it's about and what you think about that. 
And then you can look over at John Cale or Lou Reed, and whatever you're feeling, you could project onto one of those two people. And this, I think a new fact happens in the mind of every audience member has their own experience with moments like that. So um, I think the film is very much about handing over to the audience and saying, what does this make you think or make you feel like? Which is Warhol all over the place. So. I, would, I would definitely say, Adam, that I had that experience seeing, I don't know whether someone sensed this in the film or whether I read it afterwards, but with Warhol's screen tests, he told people to sit and then look at the camera and then he would just walk away and they'd have to just keep looking at the camera till the film ran out. And the experience for me when I saw the film of watching John Cale or Nico or whoever it was from the band look directly at me was an extremely powerful one. And I think that that's an amazing risk that you took with that footage um, in terms of how people might respond to that and then having that split screen with the archival footage. And it really, at least for me, was an incredible experience and I'm, and I'm sure it is for a lot of people. Um, I wanna leave time for some questions, but and, and I do have a couple of additional questions that I really do want to get to, but I don't want to run out of time. Does anyone have a question at this point? Brian in the back. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it was it was because the Velvet Underground doesn't make any sense in musical history. There's nothing that leads up to the Velvet Underground that you could say, see, that's how they became this band. So you had to work really hard to put Lou and John together. So you had to create all the elements that were Lou and all the elements that were John, and you had to respect that that was going to take a lot of time. And also, when you feel yourself like, when am I gonna hear a Velvet Underground song already? And then it explodes. Yeah. I think Todd would describe I'm it sure. as saying like, that's what it must have felt like to hear them for the first time. It's like, oh shit, this is incredible. So yeah, it was easy decision. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, we went to Georgia, uh, rural Georgia, where Mo lives. Um, I just want to interject that Maureen Tucker, Mo, is, is the band's drummer. Yeah, and I mean, it was a real process to get to her. Many people who were interviewed for the film don't have email or cell phones, and they have answering machines. Like, it's, it's been, it was like a really, you know, kind of treasure hunt in a lot of ways to get to people, but... Once, so we weren't sure since it was so difficult to get get to her. When we got there, we were like, is she, what is she going to be like? She could not have been more gracious. I mean, when she was saying that, it was so hard not to like cackle laughing on the set when she was saying all that. We're like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Um, and she was absolutely, she would take cigarette breaks and and then come back and go again. She was She gave us a full day and was incredibly generous. She, she was dry and direct and marvelous and uh, thoughtful um, and gave us a really yet another insight, a unique insight, because she was kind of like, you know, the one that was brought in to, to fill in a space of need. And her insight and her, her thoughts were, were invaluable, I felt. And she was very generous to share them with us. And... and uh, what I love about her is she's just so direct. You know, she just is telling it like it is. She's not going to make anything kind of flowery or, you know, she's just giving you her perspective, whether you like it or not, basically. And that's that's why I love her so much, because it's just a very honest perspective uh, of of the whole experience. I think the film did a 
great job with balance. And this is one of the questions that I, I wanted to get, to get to, that I'm sure this is the piece where everyone will have a different opinion, especially if they were fans of the band, that, oh, the focus was, it was Nico's film, or it was John Cale's film. Or, uh, uh, and I'm wondering how you thought about, all of you, how you thought about balance in the film and, and really creating, like, telling the, the, the story of the whole band. It's interesting, actually, because it, it, when I said earlier that like the, the the story is very lean, and I think what's interesting is what Adam was saying that it welcomes you to use your intuition to fill in the spaces that we don't directly address, because there like you know Lou had his struggles and we struggled with figuring out how to address those, and found what I think is a good is a is a good margin to give a sense of you know what he was struggling with, and I think that that's really that's what makes this work why I'm so excited about this film that that it doesn't tell you everything it requires so much of your own natural intuition to be brought to it yeah and that tells the story as much as what's here anyone else I would say I think the because of the deep dive and the research that we did there are so many incredible stories around the band and what they did and certain performances and everything. And I think what, you know, cause I would come to the guys and be like, are you going to put this in? You have to put this in. This is amazing. And they're like, no, we're not going to put it in, you know? And so the restraint, you know, of like really kind of staying on Todd's vision and letting the visuals take the lead, I think is kind of what I, what I love the most about the film. Um, so, you know, there, it, uh, there's so many hysterical, like every time Lou Reed says something, I'm hysterical because he just has such a dry sense of humor. Yeah. And I'm like, how can you not put more of him in? Cause he's just so fucking funny. Like, you, you know, have more of Lou in, but it was really the right. Less is, it's a less is more. Less thing. is more. Like the bound, this, it was, I think they did an amazing job kind of finding the right way of telling the story and the right balance and the right voices to tell each perspective. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what was really complicated was actually, I mean, we knew that we want to use as much as we could from, from the banana album, mm -hmm. but then what music to use from the following album? Because as we know, people be like, how come, you know, Cool It Down is not here, or Jesus is not here, what happened, you're not doing this. But then they go deep. find it. Then they can go find it. But there had to be a logic, like this song links to this song, who moves the story along. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd just be, okay, we just listen to music now. And everybody has a favorite, they're probably not going to be in the film. I'm sorry, we had songs that we really wanted to be, there's just didn't fit. We tried, it just didn't fit. So we had to, we knew how, like, we knew the end before we the film was done and kind of sometimes we kind of reverse engineer to get the beginning to the end to link up. Gotcha. And so how do we, like we had to create the right path, use the right music. I just got the sign that we have to wrap it up. Um, but thank you so much for bringing thank you, in this thank film. You. Thank you. Thank you so that much. is uh, such a... Such a burst of creativity during this time. And I think all of you are absolutely correct that the film, and it sort of leaves us with peak creativity um, and ends at a point where you can pick up on the band and, and find your own story with, with them. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you thanks. so much. Thank, thank you. you.